All right, so I'm going to just start with a case that involves um, a range from Dr. the patient being. Dr. Mint, Mintz, yeah. can you switch your uh, your view? We're seeing yeah, like yeah. Uh, the presenter view. Yeah. Uh, just if you go to display settings there on the yeah, left yeah. of that. Yes. And just hit uh, swap. There you go. That work? Just taking a second to load up. There we go. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and if anyone sees uh, Dr. Brubaker hop on, please let me know. Um, okay. All right. So uh, this is a case that uh, is a great, just a, a great example of some of the challenges that we're facing in a, a classic case of this patient population. They were touched at clinic in a CCWV system, not Marlinton or Green Bank, uh, but I did think it was interesting um, and then was uh, worked on by Dr. Michael at Buchanan and then transferred to here and then back. Um, so uh, briefly, this is a 73-year-old male that was sent from our podiatry colleagues at Buchanan, um, Dr. Michael, uh, to the Ruby ED with an infected foot wound. Uh, the patient has medical history significant for diabetes, coronary artery disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and history of DVTs, uh, specifically his clinical course. So uh, he showed up. He was he's a patient of CCWV in Buckhannon, um, and uh, so was was being seen regularly there. The last foot exam that I saw on the patient in their records is from July 2022, um, and you could see in the notes that they are aware the patient had a history of foot ulcers in the past. But um, I, I want to highlight it because I think one of the things that is so successful in our clinic partners is that we're using the actual ADA guidelines because I think if they had used the ADA guidelines, this could have been pre prevented because they just had him on a year follow-up when, as we know, this is someone who has a more acute, he's a healed ulcer, so he really should be getting seen at least every three months and should have been set up with a podiatrist already. Um, so I think this is kind of highlighting something important that the clinics that are in the project are doing that could be something that we, we could think about. Um, <clears throat> so... The patient was seen November 8th uh, with a one-week history of a diabetic foot ulcer from a diabetic shoe that rubbed. Uh, they did a superficial wound culture at that time, which came back as MSSA. They did not do any labs. The x-ray was negative for osteo. The patient was started on Augmentin and referred to see podiatry in his primary care. Uh, I don't see that he got to primary care, but he did get seen by podiatry uh, on the 15th. He was referred to vascular at that point. Um, an appointment had been made for him for about a month from there, and the decision was to just uh, do beta dye dressing and offloading, and you could see this is what the foot looked like at that time. So not major infection, but some eschar. Um, the patient did have a an endocrinology appointment uh, where they were talking about his hemoglobin A1C and congratulating him on that, and remarked in their note that the patient has a foot ulcer, but again, never looked. Um, went to podiatry two days later, where there was concern for growing erythema around the wound. Um, Dr. Michael sent the patient for uh, labs, which showed elevated white count, worsening AKI, uh, elevated uh, inflammation markers. They did an x-ray still negative for osteo, but based on this clinical picture, uh, Dr. Michael reached out to me and uh, she, she told me she was gonna have the patient go directly to the Ruby ED uh, just because you know transfer times are, have been a nightmare for us. So the patient made their way over to RER, um, and the patient uh, was a, came to RER overnight. They were admitted to the medicine service for IV antibiotics. They got kind of the big big guns, um, and also hydration. The that next morning we did PVR ABIs, which you can see on the right, a pretty flat line at the toe, um, indicating probably poor, poor wound healing potential. Um, for people, just we we did. Um, then uh, classify the wound. Um, and so here, that was the, sorry, uh, that. Uh, I did grade the wound and this is kind of the grading system that we use. And that's kind of when you fill out a case form, these are kind of what these questions are based on because it helps us to categorize and stage the wounds. So uh, because the, this was involving the midfoot and had gangrene, it, I gave the wound a three. Um, ischemia also would be a three because his, his toe pressures were less than 30. 
And then from foot infection, this is a mild infection local involving the skin and tissue. So that would get a one. So then you put it into like this fancy computer. And so there's three, three, one. You put it into fancy computer and then it tells you stage four. So what does stage four mean? And this whole system is supposed to be like cancer screening. So you can have an informed discussion with patients. But basically that this patient's at high risk for an amputation, but also high potential benefit from getting revascularized. So just to give a window into the thought process when we see these patients. Um, so we hydrated the patient, brought them to the OR. Um, and right before I did that, so this is all within like 12 hours of the patient presenting. Um, I did talk to our inpatient podiatry colleagues to let them know that, hey, I'm going to take this patient. Um, and uh, they were the plan was, okay, great. As long as nothing had to be drained emergently, which I knew that from my outpatient colleagues that nothing had to be drained. Um, so she was gonna see them after. So this was, you know, just very small vessel disease. He did have his, his posterior tubular artery was out. He had a 50% stenosis of popliteal. Um, we took care of the popliteal, could not get across the long segment PT. I did go uh, pretty hard at going for the small vessel disease. So we did balloon open um, his AT distally and his DP with some varying results. But uh, based on these findings, I kind of talked to both inpatient and outpatient podiatry to make a plan. Um, and the plan was, you know, I was like, you got to take care of this as soon as possible because this thing's not, this is not going to stay open very long. Um, and based on how hard it is to get an outpatient MRI, they did request that, Hey, can we get the MRI while they're here? This will help guide our debridement plan. So the plan was, okay, we did the revask, going to go back to his home podiatrist and, uh, they're going to debride it. Can we get this extra info? So they did. Um, this showed fifth metatarsal head osteo, and this is the, the picture I got from Dr. Bozia. Thank you. Um, infectious disease saw the patient as well, and they recommended a four to six week course of oral antibiotics um, with levoquin, linazolid, metronidazole. And then our co-pat, which is our like outpatient ID people came by and said, nah, just moxifloxacin. So he was discharged. And then the next day came to see his podiatrist as outpatient. He had, apparently his pain was really bad and he had new bl blistering. And so he, they restarted IV antibiotics, admitted him. At that time, they got the x-ray that also at this point now finally confirms osteo. Um, patient ended up with a partial fifth rate amputation. They got deep wound culture that con confirms S MSSA. Um, and this is where we're at about two weeks post-op. Um, so that is this case. Um, and I, I think it's just a good example of the full spectrum of uh, the patients uh, being seen. Um, so I didn't know if Dr. Bozia wanted to say anything about the case. Um, I'm not super thrilled that the patient required immediate readmission. <laughs> um, I don't know if Dr. Michael has made her way on here or if it's going to be Addison, if you're able to say a few words. Dr. Mintz, do you think that some of the pain might have been just revascularization pain? I don't know. I think one of the misses that we had system-wise is that the patient was here for like a week. We kind of signed off after we revascularized and we had our plan. But if this had been a lot worse right when he was discharged, then we, we maybe what it wasn't great that we discharged him like this. Well, he had immediate follow-up, I think, with Dr. Michael, like within days of his discharge. Yeah, the next day. And she immediately <laughs> readmitted him <laughs> because of the pain and needing antibiotics. Yeah. Well, just to, you know, a couple thoughts about the MRI. So MRIs are very um, sensitive to osteomyelitis, over 90%. And if you're looking at the imaging, this one is basically T2 or STIR. STIR is an abbreviation of short tau inversion recovery. What that means is it basically makes it a little bit even more um, sensitive to water. So we're looking for, if you look at that fifth metatarsal, it looks brighter on imaging. And so generally with osteomyelitis, you see bone marrow edema. And that's why, you know, that bone would look a little bit lighter than the surrounding bone. So generally T2 or STIR is really what we're looking primarily. Um, um, T2 is actually fat weighted. T1, I'm sorry, I'm reversing that. T2 is water weighted. T1 is fat weighted. So I'm looking at T2. So I always think H2O water and then also the stir um, for imaging like this. Um, if if there's So if the patient has had previous surgery or um, it's a very mixed picture, especially for someone with charco neuroarthropathy, um, I usually like a white blood cell tag bone scan because I feel like it gives you a much better picture of 
um, you know, extension because it's actually um, radioisotopes that are attached to the white blood cells. So you can actually see it glow because the imaging is different. We're taking pictures with a gamma camera. Um, and so either way, um, you don't have to have contrast. So that's good to know too, especially for uh, patients that might have some kidney dysfunction or disease. So, um, you know, you could just do for quick and dirty, you could do an MRI without contrast. And that would probably give you some uh, pretty good information. The only time I ever question it would be, like I said, if they've ever had previous surgery, which can also cause bone marrow edema and or shark or neuroarthropathy, which can be very confusing on an MRI, in which case then I usually defer to a white blood cell tag bone scan. Uh, from our outpatient podiatry colleagues, um, from Ruby anyways, I mean, do you, did we, should we have done something before the patient left or do we feel like, you know, we were revascularized what we could, it was already, it's already dicey. Um, wanted to see what was going to happen. <laughs> you revascularize a patient. How long do you feel like it's going to last? Well, um, I thought Dr. Hurst, are you, you were. Oh, I was just, I was just saying I would have done something probably right away. Um, because when you think about it, like, what's the best chance of healing is going to be right after they revast. So, I mean, even from like a pressure relieving standpoint, you can argue like you could just do a fifth met head resection immediately um, instead of like sending back and, and going back. Um, so that's something I would certainly think about like doing right away. And from just like a, you know, using clinical judgment type thing, you start to argue like, okay, well, it's just something that's what I would do. Or even if you're worried about infection, you can always stage it, you know, take it out, let it drain for a couple of days and then go delay primary closure. But so that's because now you're like set, you know you're several weeks after revast, hoping that this thing heals up, and you already have some like scar in that proximal aspect. Yeah, I don't like how it looks. Um, so, I will say, I don't know. and like what you have like one year maybe that this thing's gonna hold up. I like so. <clears throat> well, I think in general, I don't know like how well it's gonna do. I will say we do have you know literature saying like if you can wait, because there's a lot of apparently tissue that kind of opens up a little bit over time. So like when people are doing those like desert feet and more advanced revascularizations, um, they are, there is discussion about like even waiting a month before doing the TMA, the definitive procedure, because they feel like the revascularization, it is recruitment um, <clears throat> and improved revascularization. So I, I think it's like, it's a little bit, difficult. I think for this, I want, I just wanted to be done within a month, but I was surprised that he like was doing so poorly so quickly. Yeah. I tend to be, you know, I, I think, and obviously you, you're looking at the whole patient, not just, you know, the foot, you're looking at all the other things, but I think sometimes after patients be, has been revascularized, you know, sometimes you do see improvement in soft tissue and, or sometimes worsening in the, you know, in that, in that area. And I would want to have something that's a little bit more demarcated to make it clear what's going to stay and what's going to go. And then usually when I do, you know, partial fifth raise, which I agree with Dr. Michael, um, I even go a little bit more aggressive and I'm looking for an additional proximal margin that I send separately to eval for clear margin. That way I know I've gotten everything. And so, you know, I, when I'm doing surgical planning, I'm going past the border where I think it's going to be infected because I want a clear margin. That way, that actually also dictates what post-op antibiotics are going to be needed. So if you don't get clear margin, you have to assume you have residual osteo and that patient might be on six weeks of IV antibiotics, which of course takes a toll on the kidneys. But if you can get a clear margin, maybe they only need 10 days of orals for maybe just residual cellulitis. And so a lot of it, like, as you mentioned, I mean, I, I want to make sure that if I'm going to do the surgery, that the tissue is going to be healthy enough to be able to, to stick together. And I think in this case, you know, this patient's tissue, it just got very friable looking. And maybe that's part of, you know, the issue that he's having is just not wanting to really um, come together, not co-opt well. He has pretty, you know, he has a lot of small vessel disease. Um, Dr. Denny, apparently a couple years back, did an angio on him and did nothing and said, you have small vessel disease and put him on Eliquis. Mm. So there's that as well. But I think this is kind of like, we did our best 
I don't know if it's going to heal, but I don't think he has a lot more options. So we'll kind yeah. of see from there. Um, I mean, this fast tracked about as good as you're going to get. I mean, literally everything was done within days. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, from my, from a prevention end, I think maybe if we could have gotten, you know, better offloading ahead of time or whatever, maybe it would have helped, but um, all right, that's that one. I saw Dr. Brubaker's on, so I do want to get to his cases. Um, and we do have the cases as well, the you know, Dr. Hurst presentation. Um, so I just wanted to go over two referrals that I saw on Friday um, from Dr. Brubaker's clinic that were, I just thought, great catches and good thing to talk about. Um, so uh, the first one is a 58-year-old male that was had incidental finding of left subclavian artery stenosis, uh, was being evaluated for uh, finger numbness bilaterally and a carotid duplex got done during that period. Uh, one of the vertebral arteries showed tardis partis waveforms, a CTA was performed, showed stenosis. But while the while Dr. Boudicca was talking to him, he also mentions that he has this groin pain that radiates down the legs when he overexerts himself, causing thigh pain. And when, you know, further asking him, I'm like, well, how far is overexerting? And he's like five minutes of walking. <laughs> Um, he's also a heavy smoker, quote unquote, pre-diabetes. Uh, he last got checked, I think, over the summer. I would not be surprised if he crosses over. Um, and his legs are are just signal. He only has signals. So basically, Dr. Rubaker, you made the diagnosis in clinic. Uh, I know you want to get ABI PDRs, but um, I I think it's a great example because I wasn't even. Honestly, I saw less of cleaving stenosis. I was like, oh, all right, I'm going to look at that. And then I think he said something to me like, well, you know, my doc also thinks that there might be uh, some disease in my arteries and my legs because I had this complaint about some groin pain. And then I asked him further and he, he does have sexual dysfunction. And that's actually part of a triad where you, if you can't feel a pulse in the groin, you have claudication that's like thigh or buttock and sexual dysfunction, that's a marker for aortoiliac occlusive disease. It's called the Reese syndrome. So the odds are he probably has blockages in his iliac artery and his aorta. Um, and that, we, I definitely agree, we got to get those ABI PBR, so we have a baseline. Um, Dr. Brubaker already started him on Pletol, which was great. Um, and he said it helped already. And I went over very specifically what a walking program would look like since we don't have supervised exercise therapy in his area. Um, but it'll be a close follow-up, and it's just, I thought it was a great catch. I don't know if Dr. Brubaker, you want to make some comments? Um, yeah, I, um, so in, in full disclosure, I, um, uh, he, he did carry, um, a PAD diagnosis, so I, I'd love to take, like, take the, the shine on that, but, but he, he kind of showed up in the spring as, like, very, very anxious, anxiety-centered visits with just a heap of records, and, such a vascular path. So he, um, I, I think he had, so he had documented diagnosis. I don't think he understood the diagnosis of PAD. Um, and so I, I have been working on kind of driving that point home. Um, and then, uh, and then it sounds like has, has further reinforced. I did not know you said that's Reese, like Reese's pieces or something, Reese syndrome uh, or the, the triad of the more central uh, Lariche L E R I C H E. I I suspect that's what we're dealing with because he doesn't have palpable pulses in his groins and his symptoms are really focused in the buttock and thigh area, which means you have to have a higher level of net of occlusion than your classic like calf claudicants. Um and so maybe you can quickly comment. I think we probably have before, but just the um, we, we don't have any prescribed walking program concept here, but just, I, I saw that in your note, but just what, maybe what you said to him of how to think of it or just, uh, I went online with him in my office and we like found something that we both liked. Um, and I could, I can hunt around and try to send you, um, cause some of it's very intense, like for clinicians that are running a program, um, but I, I liked I liked the one that we found, so I can send you uh, something like that that kind of goes over like you warm up and you walk for this many minutes and this is the pain scale you're you're going for, um, and trying to talk to him about like where would be a safe place for him to do it, um, 
And I think I talked to him about maybe going over to Walmart uh, and doing it there. And then he could actually track the aisles that he's doing. Um, so these are just kind of thoughts from that conversation. Um, oh. And we'll see how he does. Uh, so that's that one. Um, and there's one more. <clears throat> and this is a 68 year old female that was referred because of spontaneous varicose vein bleeding. She was seen in March initially, but then uh, she she had a diagnosis of breast cancer and got lost to follow up. Um, so she came back and I was like, all right, veins, just going to take care of veins, no problems. And then I, I noticed on the notes that she has EBIs before with moderate arterial occlusive disease, which I was, uh, I was like, oh, all right, <laughs> let me take out the Doppler. Uh, and sure enough, yep, she does have moderate disease. She has no symptoms, no claudication. Um, but this brings up uh, an important thing because you guys see a lot of varicose veins. Um, and, you know, how do you manage venous insuffic insufficiency in a setting of PAD? Um, and you do need to continue the antiplatelets and everything. This lady, like, she was on dual antiplatelet because she had heart stents and has spontaneous varicose vein bleeding. So that's a little scary. Um, but she's wearing compression. I would have done her. I would do her right away if I could, but she's very reticent for a procedure. Um, but we are working towards that. Um, you can, but you can prescribe compression stockings. I believe they say up to ABI of 0.5. So you, you should try to get an ABI on somebody if you're suspecting that, because they won't be able to tolerate stockings otherwise. Um, so she's above that. So we're just, our plan will be just to get a duplex and intervene on the veins, um, with an ablation. And even I would consider staphylovectomies in her, but we have to be very cautious kind of in the lower calf because you don't want to cause a wound that's not going to heal. So there are elements there. Um, you can also use like tuba grip and other things. I know Dr. Diamond in her care, in her clinic will sometimes use other compression in patients that have bad disease. Um, but these are things that you can do. Dr. Mintz, what, what do you think the, um, the benefit of referring to a lymphedema clinic to be evaluated by a lymphedema nurse specifically for either wraps or sized compression versus just prescribing something that would be more over the counter? So the nearest, I think for you all, CAMC might have lymphedema. Uh, there is a lymphedema specialist now in Buchanan. It's uh, Lindsay Zirkel. She's an occupational therapist that does lymphedema. I've been referring from my clinic to her. Um, and I will do that in patients that just have giant legs or have a lot of trouble um, doing uh doing compression. I think that's when her legs are fairly straightforward. So I'm not, I think she can do regular compression, but it's really patients that are like, their legs are huge or really tough, or they've tried compression. It's not working, but she's very happy with what she uses. She's already using compression all the time. Um, Sam, you need to watch that too. Many, but people, a lot of people don't know most of lymphedema therapy isn't covered by insurance. So a lot of times, <clears throat> you know, patients are going to have to pay for that out of pocket, which is a financial burden you know, to a lot of times. So I did not know that. Mm -hmm. um, I usually get them one visit so they can get all the yeah. garments ordered and yeah. teach some massage and things like that, or help them get pumps. Um, but that, so those are the, the referrals. I don't know, Dr. Baker, you have a comment there. I know Dr. Hurst, you're ready to go with your presentation, I bet. Um, Nothing too much extra. Yeah, her her year got taken over by her breast cancer um, the past nine months. And it knocked us off the venous stuff, but appreciate you seeing her. Yeah, I, she seems to know what to do if she bleeds also, which is good. Um, and again, teaching them that too, because they could bleed a lot. It's pretty scary. Um, is, you know, elevate above heart level, compress, and it may be 30 minutes or more before it stops. But that's kind of it. Like if you get that leg up and you compress, it'll stop bleeding. If it still does, then ER. But uh, we talked about that. I talked about her wearing maybe some soft socks in bed because she last time she bled like a scab, like rubbed and she like bled all over her bed. So uh, we talked about that and I, ideally we'll get her <laughs> taken care of in January. All right, I'm going to bounce out of here and have Dr. Hurst take over. But please send me your patients, by the way. Send us patients. We will we'll fill out the forms for you. But please send us people that we can talk about.
All right. <clears throat> um, can everyone see that portion of the screen? Is that good? Yep. All right, great. So uh, for those that don't know, my name is Dr. Hurst. I'm one of the podiatric foot and ankle surgeons here in Elkins at Davis Medical Center. Um, so we have a pretty broad topic, but I split it up in a way that hopefully will be a little bit more able to be kind of absorbed in our, our little short session. But, you know, our topic today is going to be the non-surgical and surgical management of wounds, which that's a lot of things. So um, what we want to look at in terms of wounds and like, why are we doing this? Why do we care about this? But a lot of our problems are going to be for amputation prevention. There was over 65,700 lower leg amputations performed in the United States alone uh, with diabetes. And due to the five-year mortality rate associated with an amputation is even far worse than most malignancies even. Um, typically, when we look at people with foot ulcers um, from diabetes, it's the result of repetitive moderate stress encountered at an insensate foot, insensate foot during ambulation. So without the ability to uh, adequately respond to these noxious stimuli, patients with neuropathy may sustain a breach in the skin. Uh, it's very similar to the way sensate people uh, notice like wear holes in their stockings and their socks, but they kind of realize that um, before they develop an ulceration. Um, and as of right now, there's no current means available completely to stop the effects of neuropathy. Um, so our president is trying to prevent these wounds and focus on the redistribution of pressure. So that's where I kind of focused on in terms of this project and this this presentation in general is kind of talking about our offloading methods. So what is our goal? Our goal is ulcer-free days. Um, we want to make sure we diminish the amount of time spent with an open ulceration, because anytime you have an open ulceration, it puts you risk of infection. Um, our goal is a stable plantar grade foot. So we want something that they can ambulate with. If you, if you have something that's causing an ulceration, and we'll talk about this in the presentation as well, is that if you have something with a rocker bottom deformity or some high areas of pressure, is that really stable? Is that really a planting grade foot? Is that really something that can be used for ambulation? And then our always our goal is for them to ambulate in regular shoe gear. And I put the quotes around regular shoe gear because we have our ideas of therapeutic shoes and some other sorts of offloading within the shoe gear, but in some form of shoe gear so that they can kind of get around and be able to do things. So uh, this is a great chart um, that was in a recent study and looking at like the development of a new diabetic foot ulceration. And it's a great way to follow, kind of follow these checks and areas like, okay, peripheral artery disease, or do they have neurovascular? Is it ischemic? What type of ulceration are we dealing with? Um, the area that I really wanted to focus on in this presentation, because there's a lot of great other people on this call that have other presentations in regards to a lot of the ischemic and the uh, infection portions of these, um, I wanted to focus mostly on the area of the ulcer with no infection, um, something that will routinely come into the office in that rural setting um, and something that, hey, this doesn't immediately need something, but what can I be doing to help when they do need to see the specialist and something that may have already been done and I can help them before they go there. Um, so kind of breaking down the way that I kind of talked about our offloading, we're going to talk about our non-surgical approaches to offloading, and then we're talking about some surgical approaches to offloading as well. And I have some case examples in the surgical form as well to kind of give you with some pictures to kind of see like, okay, this is what he's kind of talking about. So first and foremost, uh, one of our bare minimum areas of in terms of offloading is going to be with a surgical shoe. So applying a rigid rocker to the end of a sole, specifically designed like as a sandal, it helps limit dorsiflexion at the metatarsal phalangeal joints. So therefore it limits the plantar progression of the metatarsal heads during propulsion and gait. So uh, due to that, we have a decreased pressure in that forefoot area. There are other areas of surgical shoes. You start to think of C1s that have an absence of the forefoot. Um, a lot of these are not used as much typically, at least in my practice, just because they can be tripping hazards for a lot of people. Um, a lot of these people do have unsteadiness in their gait. So a lot of people find that they are tough to ambulate even in this. Um, the nice thing about a surgical shoe as well is that not only is it great for the distribution of pressure uh, to allow for diminishing pressures across the area of the bottom of the foot, but it's lightweight, it's stable, it's reusable and it allows for the accommodation of dressing. So when you're doing a lot of these big bulky dressings on people, it allows for them to be able to accommodate that as well. Some other things that people uh, typically a lot, even in like rural settings um, is felted foam. The thing about foam is that it's very easy to get a hold of. 
Um, you can buy a lot of it. Um, it's very available. Um, a lot of diabetic foot centers uh, utilize foam. Uh, the problem with uh, the idea of foam is that you place a foam pad over the plantar aspect of the foot, um, and then you have an aperture around the area corresponding to the ulcer site. There's always concern of something called the edge effect, where you have an increase in shear and vertical forces at the area in the periphery of the wound, which can cause the wound to worsen. There's ways that you can cut the foam and the felt to make sure that it works a little bit better. Um, but there's anecdotal reports of success to it. But to date, there's there's no controlled studies that actually look at the outcomes associated with felted foam padding techniques. There is one study, uh, uh, Fleischley et al. He looked at um, different modes of offloading, including total contact casting, cam walkers, post-operative shoes, and felt. Um, and he found that at the very bottom in terms of offloading is going to be our felted foam dressing at the surgical site. So it does offload. Um, no, it certainly does do its job, but the problem is, is that the more they walk on it, the more it wears out. It's something that to put on every day, uh, it takes up space in shoe gear or in a post-operative shoe. And the problem is it's, it's just, there's a lot of other things that we can offload with that are not foam and felt. And one of those things that people think can do with some of those offloading is going to be your therapeutic shoes. Um, when we look at therapeutic shoes, uh, a lot of our patients are prescribed these in an effort to assist in pressure reduction and wound healing. However, when we actually look at the devices, there's, it's not really proven to be effective in this role. When we look at gate laboratory studies, it suggests that therapeutic shoes actually allow up to 900% more pressure in the areas of forefoot compared to a total contact cast and some cam walkers. Even the most optimistic studies, when you look at University of Texas wound classification or UTSA grade 1A ulcerations, and you use those shoes as an off the main primary offloading mechanism for those non-infected, non-ischemic superficial wounds, they will heal at 12 weeks. So, and that, again, those are the, the more optimistic studies. So in terms of when you have those ischemic ulcers, those uh, infected ulcers, and the wounds that are deeper than superficial, our therapeutic shoes are not going to be our best bet. So really the the point of our shoes are going to be more of a prevention of ulceration because um, Dr. Mintz has, has quoted before is that you can have up to even like some study 62% decrease in ulceration formation with the use of the therapeutic shoes rather than an offloading for an active ulceration. So they def definitely have a place. Um, it's just more of a, a balance of like, okay, you're about to be healed with your wound, but we want to make sure we get you in your shoes. So trying to figure out when is the best time to prescribe those. So we go to our big bulky, you know, most studies kind of talk about total contact casting. Total contact casting is considered the, by many foot specialists, by many studies to be the gold standard of offloading. Uh, plantar casting is used to treat the neuropathic foot. Um, it was first described by Mil uh, Milroy Paul and later popularized in the United States by Dr. Paul Brand at the Hansen uh, Disease Center in Louisiana. So how this works is that it employs a well-molded, molded, minimally padded, um, maintains contact with the entirety plantar aspect of the foot and lower leg. Um, and the total contact casting has been shown to reduce pressures at the site of ulceration by 84 to 92%. And a large body of that work supports the clinical uh, efficacy of a, a TCC or total contact cast. Um, total contact casting has been proven to be effective in a majority of non-infected, non-ischemic plantar diabetic foot wounds um, with uh, healing rates ranging from 72 to even 100%. So when you actually look at how it's working is that average throughout gait, peak plantar pressures are highest in the forefoot, while they tend to be less insignificant in the rear foot and the medial arch. So uh, Shaw and Armstrong, and then another study by uh, Stapolkley and Shea, they noted that uh, a large proportion of the pressure reduction occurs in the forefoot, um, and it's transmitted into the cast wall over the rear foot, resulting in decreased forefoot pressure. Um, this supports the, the idea by those several authors that TCC is effective because it permits walking by uh, uniformly distributing the pressures over the entire surface. And uh, besides its ca uh, capacity to offload, it protects the foot from infection, helps control edema. Um, but the most important attribute of the TCC um, is that it, 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 it breeds adherence to it. Because um, in other words, the device is not easily removed. So patients have no option other than to comply and adhere with the regimen uh, prescribed by the clinician 
because it is a, a cast on their leg. Um, so that's, this is um, unfortunately something that does have to be seen weekly. So if you do have a large patient burden, you know, when we're, when I'm seeing 25 to 30 patients, it, it can be difficult. Sometimes you're like, Oh, now I got to bring them back for total contesting. So sometimes like in areas of wound care settings, or uh, when you have a little lower patient population, it can be great. Now, the problem with total contact casting is expenses um, in terms of how expensive these can be. Uh, time consuming. So the ability to put these on, they do make now easy total contact casting, um, which I'll cover a little bit in terms of how much is actually utilized. Um, but total contact casting, as great as it does sound, it does come with risks. When we look at the risks of total contact casting, uh, the biggest things is going to be the development of ulceration from the casting. So uh, every cast um, has an overall complication rate um, in 5.52%. Uh, and when you look at like the total body of patients, about 30% of patients suffer one complication from the, uh, a total contact casting. Um, a lot of these can be user errors. Some of them can be, you know, ill-equipped padding at certain areas. Um, a lot of them can just be like overuse in the total contact casting. Um, a lot of our areas that we look for that result in ulceration development are going to be free tibial because when you lock up the ankle joint with that total contact casting, a lot of the forces are uh, distributed to the anterior aspect of the tibia. So there's an example there, uh, the dorsal aspect of digits, especially at the MBJ with uh, hammer toe deformities and rubbing on that plastic material. And the thing is, these are uh, insensate people. So they're not feeling that these casting are rubbing. So making sure that you're taking the time and making sure that you're doing a good job putting on these total contact casts can be something that we can decrease these uh, new ulcerations. But when you look at some of the studies in regards to ulcerations developed from total contact casting, uh, no pre-existing ulcer was made worse by the total contact cast. It's just that they had a new ulceration. A lot of them did heal without any issues as well. So I mean, do we patients actually- Patients do hate them though, by the way. <laughs> yeah, patients do hate them. So do we practice what we preach? Um, I think that's the biggest thing is that, hey, you know, I just talked, you know, for three minutes about how great total contact casting is. But in reality, when we look at studies in regards to the use of total contact casting, we don't use them. Um, about 1.2% of the time, we're actually using total contact casting in our day-to-day -to, -day, um, to say that... Uh, it's great that they have a high proportion of wound healing um, in a shorter amount of time than a lot of our other offloading modalities. Um, it's great, but the thing is, is that we're not using them. And it's a lot of things I talked about before is that, hey, the time to put it on, the resources, like to say, I can barely get a surgical shoe in my office for, for people because of the reality of things. Like how am I gonna supply a bunch of total contact casts for people as well? Um, and there's certainly ways that you can do it. You don't need these easy total contact castings. You can use plaster material. Um, one of the gentlemen um, at UPMC, he would utilize just uh, fiberglass and make his own with some other like um, areas of foam and felt padding to offload the area of the forefoot. But that is, again, time consuming. And when you have residents that can help you with a lot of those things, it makes it a lot easier. But when you're just yourself in a row and you got 30 people to see, it's, it gets difficult. So that's why a lot of that percentage is a lot lower. So people actually start to uh, move into cam walkers. Um, so these rigid supported devices are great in terms of offloading forefoot pressures as well. Um, when you look at the potential advantages over traditional total contact casting, uh, removal of walkers, as their name implies, they're easily removed. Um, so it allows for self-inspection of the wound, application of topical therapy. So if they need frequent dressing changes, if you have a, a wound that's very moist and a wound that's very drain has a lot of drainage, uh, sometimes a total contact cast might be contraindicated. Um, if you have a wound that's infected and you want it to be monitored a lot more frequent than in a total contact casting, which is one of the contraindications to that. Uh, it can be allowed for an infected ulceration as well. Um, we look at like peak pressure of the ulcers beneath the metatarsal heads uh, with this. Uh, when you look at two randomized controlled trials uh, for the proportion of field ulcers compared to total contact casting, um, it has shown that some rigid cam walkers are um, a little bit less than total contact casting, but can be just as utilized and well suited for our offloading purposes. But the big thing and the big inherent con is you notice it's a pro and a con is the removable aspect of the device. Um, Armstrong looked at uh, a study back in 2003 where he had people have a cam walker on and he actually put a, um, a speedometer or a, like a excuse me, um, basically a pedometer in the device. And he wanted to look at like, hey, how much are these people wearing the device? And he found that people are only wearing their cam walkers up to 30% of their daily activity. 
So you have these patients come back and you're like, oh, how much are you wearing your boot? I'm like, I'm wearing it all the time. And in reality, you can only guesstimate that they're probably only wearing about like 30%. So that's why the total contact casting has that advantage in terms of wound healing. But in terms of offloading, a cam walker can do just as much and be very helpful. Um, Cruz um, et al., him, he's uh, the, one of the biomechanical professors at Shoal College. Um, he compared three different heights of cam walkers in terms of uh, going ankle high versus all the way up to knee high. Um, he said that they're uh, similar offloading capacity between knee high walkers and ankle high walkers. Um, so for a lot of people with bigger legs where it's difficult to have fittings of cam walkers that are knee high, um, people who have lymphedema can be difficult to get them fitted. Sometimes an ankle one can be suited as well. I don't carry any ankle high uh, cam boots because um, a lot of the times I do need the knee high, but just for completeness sake, it can be helpful to realize like, okay, well, this could be suitable for uh, an offloading purpose as well. So now we're going to kind of talk about some of the surgical ways that we can deal with the management of our wounds. And again, we're going to be talking about, and I mixed in some like infected and non-infected things within this as well. Um, so looking at our most basic form of management of our surgical wounds um, is going to be debridement. Um, this has been talked about before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it's the removal of the non-viable material foreign bodies of poorly healing tissue. Uh, when you look at our debridement, um, there is a lot of literature uh, that looks at like how helpful debridement is because, you know, the amount of times you hear people go, oh, yeah, I went and saw someone, they scraped at it and my wound got worse. Um, you know, in reality, it's like, well, you know, you remove all that hyperkeratotic tissue, you remove all that non-viable tissue, like now you have a healthy granular wound that yes, in theory, looks bigger to patients, but in reality is a lot better because um, I always talked about people about how helpful the Bradman is. There was a study um, by Dr. Steed at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. They're actually looking at human growth uh, platelet factors. So they're looking at these platelet-derived growth factors that they're putting in wounds. And they're doing this all over the country. And Dr. Steed's uh, patients who were using the growth factor and even the, the control study who were using the growth, who weren't using the growth factor, we're healing at a lot higher rate for people than compared to the rest of the country. Um, so what they actually found out was that he was actually bringing a lot of his patients back for routine debridements of it. So the study showed that there was really no difference of that human growth factor. But the biggest thing was, is that it showed that wound debridement is a vital adjunct in the care of patients with chronic diabetic foot ulceration. So debridement is one of our cornerstones of treatment of our, of our wounds. So I do have a, um, example of something like how successful debridement can be and why it is something that is, is necessary. Uh, this is a 36 year old male that presented to our emergency department uh, with worsening signs to his right lower extremity. Um, he does have issues with substance abuse um, and we theorized that he injected to the inner space of his right lower extremity, but really unsure. Uh, but he had worsening signs and symptoms regarding his right leg. Uh, started on IV antibiotics. He did have a CT scan performed, which should, showed no drainable abscess to that right lower extremity. Um, but then due to his worsening signs, he is actually intubated and sent to the ICU. Um, over a day or so, it certainly did start to worsen. This was the next day that I saw it. And at that point, I was like, okay, we need to bring this in for a surgical debridement of this lower leg, uh, try and get rid of all that non-viable tissue. Um, so this was kind of it, like after starting on the IV antibiotics and before we kind of, like, this is our second debridement. So the, uh, we kind of did like a stage procedure in regards to debridement of that lower leg. Uh, so we took a wick blade and kind of removed all that non-viable tissue. Um, this was a status post the first day after uh, one of the debridements and granular tissue looking a lot great. Um, so brought him then at that point, I was like, okay, hey, we managed the infection. Um, we managed the non-viable tissue. We want get, to get this skin covered up. So at that point, I brought him back for application of um, some allografts. Um, this is actually status post um, one of his allograft applications. Um, I cut off the area of the foot. I was actually bringing him back for a foot debridement because on the dorsal aspect, he had some eschar there. But just so you can see the power of just at, like some allograft application and how powerful um, just some debridement going from an area, a leg that you look at, you're like, is he going to keep this to something that he's walking um, and working back in after a couple of weeks even too. Um, so just kind of the power of how great debridement can be in terms of our surgical management of our wounds. Um, the next way we're going to talk about is actually going to be amputation. Um, amputation is not always considered a failure in terms of our wound healing. Um, a lot of amputation uh, can allow for ulcer-free days. Um, the problem with amputation is that, and I'm talking about minor amputation, including things that are uh, 
consistent with the foot rather than our major amputations considering uh, below knee or above knee amputation. Um, but it also uh, risk of recurrence of ulceration. Um, that's the biggest thing in terms of our amputation. It's not definitive in terms of that. So a lot of times we do have high rates of, of re-ulceration uh, re and even re-amputation rate on these patients. Um, so looking at like some of the studies on that, um, when you look at like the rate and location of re-ulceration and re-amputation, uh, this is a study that looked at first ray amputation versus Alex amputation in diabetic and non-diabetic patients. Um, we found that the re-amputation rate in patients with partial first ray amputation is as high as 74% in some of these populations and even as high as, um, and then, excuse me, the re-ulceration, I, I relabeled, I mislabeled that, but that's the re-ulceration rate is up to 74% and the re-ulceration even hallux amputations can be up to 61%. With our reamputation rate noted to be 43% for hallux amputations and 51% for partial first ray amputation. So, hey, I can get wounds closed with amputations, but are we going to remain closed? You know, sometimes it's a toss of a coin at that point, but it can be very successful for patients that are have an infection or for people that, hey, we had a patient that. Um, needed a procedure done in terms of a colostomy. They didn't want to do an open. They didn't want to do a procedure with an open ulceration. So you perform an amputation, even on a non-infected ulceration, to close that up so that they can be healed in three weeks rather than twelve weeks. Sometimes that can be very successful for people. Um, but the biggest thing that we found is that Halix amputations, when you look for re-ulceration rate, it's going to be at the digits. When you look at partial first ray amputations, a lot of the times that the ray amputation is going to lead to a re-ulceration at the wound site. So those are some key things is that like, hey, when I lose the big toe, look at the other toes, make sure you're looking at those because those are the most common place for re-ulceration. When someone does something with a partial first ray, uh, look at the area of the incision because a lot of the times that incision is going to be what, what opens up. Um, certainly it can be about some biomechanical that I'll, I'll say for another day, but about how important like the, the length of the first ray can be with our ambulation. Um, just an example of like how helpful it can be in terms of amputation, but this is a patient, 74 year old male, history of diabetes, um, coronary artery disease, who presented with ulceration of plantar aspect of the second metatarsal head, history of multiple amputations already to that left lower extremity. Um, and in terms of infection, he did, uh, at the time he did show like, you know, this has been something that's been a chronic issue for the patient with recurrent uh, areas of infection, recurrent admission rates uh, for that left side. Um, so at that point, we kind of decided for a transmetatarsal amputation for that patient. And this is an example of like the things that you can do for wound healing, even with a amputation that you can allow it to be even more proximal. Um, because our, our, you know, there's studies that look at length of rays in terms of re-amputation and re-ulceration rates for our transmetatarsal amputations. So the idea is like try and keep as much as you can. So a lot of the things you can do, a lot of the things with skin plasty and moving tissue and closing tissue. Um, so that's kind of what this looks like in terms of, and I have a picture of our post-op too, um, but that's his immediate post-op, uh, transmetatarsal amputation. But the way that we close it is that you kind of V out that area of the um, ulceration. Um, a big thing is, you know, making sure that, hey, you have an incision on the bottom now. We got to make sure you kind of stay off of this foot and keep you non-weight bearing. Um, but then we remove the stitches. You still have like a little, a lot of times, like if you had re-ulceration, a lot of times it's at that corner, you know, cause you're, you're asking a lot for uh, 90 degree angles to heal in a lot of times. So a lot of times you can end up with some wound healing after the fact, but the thing is, is that now I have a wound on the anterior foot rather than the bottom of the foot. So it makes it a lot easier to get healed up. And then you have a patient that kind of ends up looking like this coming to your clinic and you're like, okay, that looks way better for this person. So um, it can be very helpful in terms of wound healing. And now he's on a every three month schedule to make sure that he does well. And then finally, uh, Reconstruction. Um, a lot of times you have deformities that cannot be corrected or braced. Um, this is a study in terms of classification for by Freikberg, um, which is well known in uh, some of the literature in terms of, he talks about a lot of times like Charcot. Um, he talks about in terms of, he has a classification in terms of Charcot location. Um, but a lot of these are just some examples and I won't go in detail because I have some case examples about like what we can do in terms of reconstruction to actually remove because you know okay it makes sense that we can get a wound healed at you know 12 weeks in a boot or a total contact cast but what happens when they go back into a shoe you know they still have a deformity that's non-reducible uh they have a non-planetary foot can they actually are they going to stay healed and that's always the biggest question for people so one of the things that we do to help aid in our treatment of these is actually the use of external fixation the great thing about external fixation it can reduce deformities 
Uh, it can um, help optimize our soft tissue envelope. It allows for ulcerations to heal, allows for skeletal stabilization, and a lot, you know, getting people a lot healthier in terms of controlling of A1C because you're not using internal fixation that puts people at a way higher risk of infection, especially in our diabetic patients. Um, so I have a couple case examples of kind of like our big, re, you know, some reconstructions that we've done here in Elkins to kind of show like, okay, yeah, we can get some of these wounds healed. So uh, this is a 57 year old male, history of hypertension, sleep apnea, diabetes, uh, peripheral neuropathy. Um, he presented with worsening ulceration um, as well as dislocation of the subtalar joint. Um, so the talus actually did not collapse into the calcaneus. So when you're looking at these uh, ankle radiographs, it's actually to the side. So the calcaneus is lateral to the talus. Um, we would always call this a sidecar deformity because of uh, looking at uh, motorbikes with a sidecar, that's what it kind of looks like, is that you have two areas of a, of a sidecar deformity. Um, so clinically, this is what the patient looked like. He had a large ulceration on the plantar aspect. He had a deformity that was non-reducible. So to say that this guy is going to do well in a brace or some, there's no way. You know, this is something, yeah, okay, yeah. And he has a leg that wouldn't really accommodate a lot of those things. Um, so to say, like, this is going to get better in total contact, I think even though, and he's already done a lot of those things like boots and walkers and Pegasus offloading shoes, um, that it comes, it's like, okay, let's do something more aggressive in terms of wound healing. So, um, what you actually end up doing is you put him in an external fixation device. So you use a close reduction of that deformity. So you have to bring the heel, uh, back immediately and get it back under the talus, um, and use an external, uh, external device to help keep him out to length, allow for that soft tissue to heal. It allows you to do wound care as well for these, uh, for this to heal as well. So radiographically, uh, you can see that now we have our talus and we have, uh, now the calcaneus underneath that talus. Um, but the biggest thing is that our problems are is that, you know, even when we take this device off, he's certainly going to be at risk of this re-dislocating and the calcaneus swinging back from under. So a lot of the times these are stage procedures for a more formal reconstruction at the end. So at that point, about 10 weeks post-op, the wound was healed, A1C is under control at 7.0. Um, so we removed the device in office because these people are neuropathic. So uh, a lot of times you can remove that external device in the office and cast them until their final reconstruction. So what we end up doing is actually fusing their ankle joint and fusing that subtalar joint uh, to allow for a stable plantigrade foot that can be put in shoe gear, which is our whole goal of this, is that now that we have a wound free now, there is argument like, hey, you're putting a intramedullary rod through the area of ulceration. But, you know, when you have a discussion about like the risks associated with it, um, so maybe sort of looks like Dr. Hurst froze there for a second. Oh, man, Dr. Hurst, if you can hear, oh, there, you're back. You're back. Is okay. it? No, Doctor Hurst, we we've lost you there. Yeah, might have. I'll text him. Sure. I want to see what happens. <laughs> well, he's maybe he's logging back in. I I stopped his screen share, so maybe that would help with his internet. Um to get back there, he goes. Hey, Dr. Hurst, you froze. Are you back? I know, where did, I'm back. Where did I uh, cut out? Uh, we don't know what happened yet with the patient. Okay. You're putting intermedullary rods in and okay, hopefully great. showing us a beautiful finished product. Okay, good, because I do have a good photo. Uh, can I get the shares, the screen share back? Dr. Hurst, can I ask a quick question while you're doing that? Is do yeah. you use any advanced imaging prior to the IM rod to confirm that there is no residual osteo or infection? Um, typically not. A lot of the times is that I do talk about the risks associated with that. Um, I talk to them about we do the six weeks of IV antibiotics associated with that as well. Um, so it's it's understand because you know what am I going to do? Remove the entirety of the heel bone. Um, no, cause then they won't have something to ambulate on. So it's something like, Hey, this is our, our effort to keep your leg in terms of, and give you and our limbs salvage. So a lot of times is that 
it won't add anything for me. Um, I, I, there is, you know, like you can argue like, would you do different fixation? Like you could argue that, but I think in terms of allowing and making sure that that thing does not re-dislocate, um, our instrument rod is one of our better things and stronger devices for that rather than like, because whatever you're going to do an anterior plate, you're not going to be spanning that. Just some inch, like some 7.0 screws aren't going to really help with that either. So I'd rather have a, you know, 10 millimeter rod holding that. Does that impact the antibiotic course? Uh, nope, because they're getting their antibiotics while they're in the external fixator. Okay. Because they go like wait 10 weeks until, so I wait for infection to clear and I wait for um, all of that to, to finish, finish. So this is our finality of it too. This is about six months after our, our intramedullary rod. So he's actually doing quite well in ambulating in, uh, in regular shoe gear. Um, so a lot of times like that was with closed reduction um, and external fixation, but a lot of times we sometimes have to manipulate the foot in other ways to, to help with closing. So this is a patient, a uh, 47 year old male, uh, presented to the emergency department with worsening signs and symptoms in regards to his ulceration um, as well. Um, so this is his radiographs. Um, and we can see that there is certainly a disruption at the midfoot. Um, these are non-weight bearing films, but you can already tell that there is certainly a negative cuboid height. Um, so certainly something that like, hey, even if you got this healed up, this is something that's been a recurrent ulceration for him, recurrent infection for him um, that has gotten better in offloading that I didn't do, but was someone else was managing. Um, but it's something that can be certainly look at this. I'm like, there's, you know, obviously you have not stayed healed with a deformity that kind of looks like this. So uh, what you end up doing is that I first took him for initial IND um, and cleared the abscess to the plantar aspect of that foot. Um, now he's, you know, we're dealing with kind of like a charco deformity of that midfoot. So at that point, you know, like once I'm, you know, hopeful for a lot of that area to be cleared up, um, what we actually do is we put him in an external fixation device. And the great thing about this is that what I actually did was a midfoot osteotomy to the plantar aspect. Um, so after the like initial IND and after, um, which is just like about a week or so after that, we lay, waited for the soft tissue envelope to kind of stabilize. You're able to cut out a wedge of bone. Um, and what you're actually looking at is a, a wedge of bone that looks like more of a triangle. So you can swing that forefoot down. And the great thing is that you have such redundant tissue here that you're able to close primarily this ulceration. And then you keep him in this uh, external fixator while he's receiving his IV antibiotics in terms of it. And then you actually use pins spanning the area uh, to help hold our reduction as well. Um, and the same thing goes for him is that like, once we remove this device, we definitely need some sort of internal fixation. So typically my external devices stay on for about two to three months. That's typically the timeline we find that people need to allow for bone infection to clear, uh, A1Cs to get lower, um, soft tissue envelope ulcerations to heal is usually at two to three month mark. So at that point I brought him back for, uh, this is status post, um, post op uh, day seven after his intramedullary rod fixation, you can see that area of the plantar aspect where his ulceration was, is now healed. These are incisions from our, our plantar aspect. Um, and I like to avoid the area of where we are concerned for infection, especially when it's in the midfoot, um, due to the fact that um, I, there's a lot of literature in regard, there's not as much literature, but when you look at like uh, articles in regards to shown and you look at articles in regards to like midfoot pressures, a lot of it is controlled through the ankle. So why, you know, like, my idea is that like if a total contact cast can heal plantar ulcerations, why can't an ankle fusion heal ulcerations? Because with a locked up ankle, I have diminished forefoot pressures. I have diminished midfoot pressures. So I don't have to worry, but I, you know, after midfoot osteotomy, you can see that we have correction of that deformity. And I don't even bother with putting anything in the midfoot, A, because we were worried about infection there. Um, he had an abscess. He had possible bone infection. MRI is not helpful because he has a Charcot deformity. Um, he did have positive bone cultures that we kind of treated for IV antibiotics. Um, but you can see that, you know, even with nothing in the midfoot and a fused ankle, this thing, and this is uh, nine months post-op, he's doing extremely well. And this is him. This is actually like a little part of his that swelling is even more controlled now, uh, but no ulceration wounds are well healed. He's in uh, diabetic shoes. Um, and I see him every three months for routine x-rays and uh, evaluation of the foot. Um, but it's just some of the powerful things that we can do from an offloading perspective surgically as well. And I know uh, a lot of it is um, it, it's just one of those, ideas like, Hey, if I can get these even sooner, 
sometimes like you can do a lot of things and don't have to worry about bone infection. So getting them to the specialist can be very helpful too, because um, even though if you get them healed with a TCC, a lot of times like, hey, that thing may come right back. So um, if anyone has any questions, I know I went a little bit over and I apologize for that. And if I spoke quickly, I'll make sure we get these slides to, to people and I'll get them uploaded. And I had to, I'll have to do like a PDF version um, for people as well. We can take what, one to two questions here. We're almost 10 minutes after, so yeah. Uh, that was fantastic, just FYI. That was really neat. Um, do any of our primary care providers have questions about that? How much of this can be translated to what they're, what they're doing? Um, if not, that's, um, my biggest thing is like, Hey, you know, when you see these things, uh, you can get them sent out in terms of like seeing this, but, and that's the whole point is like recognizing that like, Hey, this is, you know, not just a simple ulceration in the middle of his foot. This is something that in terms of salvageability, if you, a lot of times you get these a lot sooner. A lot of times you can get them ambulating and regular shoe gear a lot quicker and with a lot less risk of recurrent ulceration. So that's kind of like, that's my whole goal is, you know, you look at the, the whole thing of save a limb, save a life. That's my idea is that I, I like to do these big reconstruction procedures to get people ambulating in regular shoe gear and everything. So I think, um, you know, something that Dr. Hurst had mentioned too, is as far as referral goes from a primary care physician standpoint is recognizing what early Charco changes look like on x-ray. I think that's probably a really commonly missed thing. Um, and I get referrals a lot for Charco foot and, um, I'm always surprised that there's a lot of, um, people even here in the emergency department that don't recognize what a, what an acute Charco foot looks like and, or what the changes look like on x-ray. And that might be a good, you know, didactic topic for future. I mean, even without x-ray though, I mean, if you're seeing like those diabetic foot changes and something looking charco -y, you definitely want to establish them with a podiatrist. I think that's yeah. like a big take home point. And the other one is, I think it's helpful for the primary care doctors to know where to look after the amputation. It's really important to drive home the point that the amputation is, it's in remission, but the disease will recur all greater than 50%. A lot of the time the disease will come back. So when someone's foot has changed its configuration, where are you going to look now? Because I'll see like a lot of primary clinic notes and they're just like amputation happened. But that's, you know, there are changes due to the amputation, but then you do need to look at certain spots on the foot, make sure that there's no ulceration forming and get them to care for that. Yeah, I've had a lot of patients too um, lost to follow up after a primary BK on one leg and then they're no longer being followed and or their doctors aren't, referring them for their other leg. And so, you know, that's also another thing I think is to get patients that, you know, may unfortunately have ended up with a below the knee amputation or above the knee on a contralateral leg, they still need to be seen for their other leg. That's a good point. All right, well, thank you everyone. This was really interesting. Uh, we're available for questions, comments. Yes, thank you, Dr. Hurst, for the presentation. Thanks, uh, Dr. Mintz, for the case presentations and everybody hanging on here. Uh, you know, yes, if you have any questions, please let us know. Be on the lookout for the recap with all the information and the uh, content. And have a great holiday. We'll see you after the holidays in the new year. Okay. Bye. Thank you.